to the Love and Guts podcast. Today I have Dr. Narala Jacoby on the cast with me. Dr. Jacoby graduated from Bastyr University in 1998 with a doctorate in naturopathic medicine. She practiced as a primary care physician in Montana for seven years before arriving in Australia. Narala is considered one of Australia's leading experts in the treatment of small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, a common cause of IBS. She is the medical director for for SIBO Test, an online testing service for practitioners. She is so passionate about educating practitioners that she founded the SIBO Doctor, an online professional education platform. She lectures nationally and internationally about the assessment and treatment of SIBO and is the host of the popular podcast, the SIBO Doctor Podcast for Practitioners. She is the medical director and senior naturopathic physician at the Biome Clinic, Centre for Functional Digestive Disorders in Mullumbimby, New South Wales. Dr. Jacoby is the co-founder of the Australian Naturopathic Summit. So in this episode, we cover... What is hydrogen sulfide? What happens when it's in excess? Do symptoms differ when hydrogen sulfide is found in the small intestine versus the large intestine? The link between hydrogen sulfide and SIBO and hydrogen sulfide and IBS-C and LIBO. How we assess for excess hydrogen sulfide and treatment strategies to reduce hydrogen sulfide And we always get into so much more because we're talking about SIBO, a topic that I love and specialize in myself. Finally, just a quick shout out to the show sponsor of the month, Nutrition Care, and in particular, their hero supplement, NC Gut Relief. Apart from helping digest food and absorb nutrients, your gut is your first line of defense, making up 70% of your immune system, which means if your gut isn't performing at its best, your overall health may be compromised too. NC Gut Relief is a science-based formulation of nutrients, herbs and prebiotics developed to help maintain gut integrity and function. I have used NC Gut Relief in clients' experience reflux and heartburn with much success. It is always important, however, to seek the support of a qualified health practitioner such as myself to ascertain whether this formula is the right fit for your needs. If you'd like to learn more about NC Gut Relief, simply head to the show notes of this podcast episode and you will find a link to product information there. And I do like to mention that, as always, the information in these podcasts are not intended to diagnose or treat a medical condition, so please ask your health practitioner before beginning any new treatment. And if you enjoy what you hear today, I would love it if you could share it with at least one other person in your life you know will benefit. And while you're at it, please leave a ratings and review on iTunes so that others can find Love and Guts easily and can fill up on the valuable content from our hand-selected health practitioners too. Welcome to the Love and Guts podcast, Dr. Narala Jacoby. I'm very excited to have you on for the next hour. Thanks for having me, Linda. Uh, You're very welcome, and I'm really excited to be getting into this topic because it's forever evolving, and I know that you've done a lot of research on it. But before we dive into that, though, I'd love for you to get into how you got to be doing the work that you're doing today, that you are doing today. The owner of SIBO Test, can't speak, (laughs) SIBOTest.com. Yes, um, and also, you know, one of the things that we did that's keeping me very busy is um, the SIBO doctor, which is really the educational platform that yes. um, has been really the focus of my attention for the past year or so to um, offer courses for pr- practitioners and for patients to understand not just SIBO, but really functional gut disorders. And um, so, yeah, so that's what's really kept me busy. But what got me into this, you know, I think, um, I mean, it goes back 20, almost 30 years ago when I started my journey into naturopathic medicine. And probably like many naturopaths, we were always fascinated with the gut and anything to do with it. And I have to say, um, it, it feels really good to be vindicated by research. Uh, and a lot of things that we that we talked about already decades and decades and decades ago about gut function and gut health and probiotics and all of that is really 
um, been validated uh, in recent years with all of that research into the microbiome. But I started out in nutrition <laughs> and um, I was really interested in that probably because when I was a baby, I had failure to thrive. And, you know, we always kind of learn more about our own pathologies. And so was always um, a student of digestive disorders. And then when I was a primary care physician in Montana, where I practiced in a really wonderful clinic that had also um, a whole detox wing where we used sauna and colonics and all of that. I really saw firsthand how powerful um, uh, modalities like colonics can be, even for things like averting an asthma attack, for example, is a classic example of what, what I witnessed there. And so my interest really intensified into that whole field of functional digestive disorders. And um, then when in 2011, when I went to a conference and heard Dr. Seeberger and Dr. Steven Sandberg Lewis speak, they really um, were my first introduction to SIBO. And I was sort of very flabbergasted, um, gobsmacked, I should say, here in Australia, that it, it really, I wasn't, I'd never heard of it. And it explained so much why some of my patients didn't improve with some of my treatment plans. So then I was just on fire because it was, it. I, you know, one of the things I really appreciate about SIBO is that it brings every possible functional gut disorder together under one title. Um, it, it can cause uh, leaky gut, it can cause different uh, food intolerances, it can cause the systemic uh, issues. And so besides all of the IBS symptoms, so I became really fascinated with that. And uh, here we are uh, many years later and really feeling like we're, we're, we're finally getting somewhere with understanding it a lot more comprehensively. And a couple of things there, I have to say, I'm a big user of the SIBOdoctor.com. I've, I've done multiple courses of yours, probably a few times. So first of all, I do want to thank you for that. I think it's just such a valuable platform for health practitioners. And if you are a health practitioner out there, I suggest you jump on and check out the courses that are available. It's, you know, it's been really invaluable for me in clinic. The second thank thing. Thank you. You're very welcome. Credit where credit is due, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Very true. <laughs> and I'm sure you put a lot of work into that, like really. Um, the failure to thrive scenario. So did you get exposed to natural therapies? Did your parents expose you to it or did you kind of enter into that world yourself? Um, so, you know, because I was a newborn, I certainly had no say in what I was given um, but I basically was not breastfed, which is the you know common scenario uh, when you were born in the late 60s. And so I just wouldn't eat and would spit up every food that was that was offered to me. And to the point this went on for quite some time and to the point where I had to get IV um, uh, nutrition and <clears throat> several times and to the where doctors finally said to my mother, look, there's nothing more we can do for her. And uh, then finally, this is kind of, this has gone, this story has gone down in family folklore, of course, because what then finally saved me was that my, that my mother's uncle was a veterinarian and he gave me piglet food, which of course is very salty. And that, I think I only got piglet food once and that made me uh, then take the bottle. So it was wow. really this bizarre breakthrough for my mother. And not that I'm advocating parents <laughs> to feed their <laughs> newborns piglet food, but so it's, you know, that is the family folklore. Now, whether or not that was the actual truth, it, I don't know, but I'm assuming so. So, but I then, uh, ne you know, really th uh, took the food and thri thrived and was fine. Mm, wow. And, and was your mother interested in that, like investigating, you know, why that was and, further on down the track for you? No, my mother was already so exhausted with having two <laughs> other toddlers before I came along. She was just happy that I think um, I pulled out of it. Yeah, fair enough. But you know, like back in Germany, because I grew up in Germany, uh, medicine was, I remember the doctors coming to the house and doing house calls and doing, you know, when we had fevers, we would get wet towel wraps around our legs. And we had a lot of natural methods uh, available to us. And so we didn't immediately get, 
uh, all of the different antibiotics that are offered, in, you know, to to young children right away. So, so I'm very grateful for that. And that's still the case today, isn't it? Where I feel as though, uh, you know, in the German culture, they kind of are mm-hmm. on a bit of the the forefront of natural therapies, and you know, they're not afraid to try that versus sure, conventional. yeah. The leading uh, flu medicine in Germany is a homeopathic. And when you go to different uh, cities in Germany, they're very into hydrotherapy, which I love, the Me use too. of water. Um, it's just, it, we had a whole year of it at Bastyr University where I went to uni. And it was, I just, it just totally resonated with my culture. So when you go to different towns, they have waiting, uh, you know, just waiting pools uh, where you just up to the knee and you just walk through it and you can see like, you know, groups of people just rolling up their pant legs and walking through the cold water and lots of different uh, stations where you can do hydrotherapy as part of your daily walk. So that's pretty cool. I love it. That's great. So today we're going to talk about hydrogen sulfide, though. Mm. So what mm-hmm. is it? And, you know, a, a small amount's OK. Is it all bad? It's not all bad. Yes. So it's it's actually a um, a third. Uh, it's what's called a gazotransmitter, right? So a gazotransmitter is a gas that's also um, kind of like a neurotransmitter. So the other two are nitric oxide and carbon mon- monoxide. But uh, but hydrogen sulfide is made by the body for different functions. Turns out that sulfur is one of the most important elements in the body. So it isn't a toxic substance at very low concentration. And what I usually, the way I describe it is that hydrogen sulfide has a Goldilocks level, right? Too much kills you, too little is also not good. So the body makes it, but then we have this other source of hydrogen sulfide, which are our gut bacteria. And that can be a problem because when you have too much hydrogen sulfide production, you can have increased inflammation, and oxidation and butyrate won't be used correctly and those kinds of issues arise and besides some of the uh, digestive discomfort that can come from bloating and gas and um, uh, things like uh, diarrhea or constipation depending on where it is located so it is a problem in high concentration and the important thing to know is that you do make it in your gut and um, that can be a problem Mm. And, and also, you know, uh, joint pain and bladder pain can be right. a bit of an issue as well, right. can't it? Yeah. So there are a number of, of symptoms that are highly suggestive of hydrogen sulfide and and burning pain, I would say, you know, burning um, severe sensitivity to alcohol, like not even one sip. Uh, those would be red flags where I would think about, oh, maybe this person is has some issues with hydrogen sulfide or is sensitive to sulfites, right? So sulfite sensitivity can sometimes also raise the level of suspicion. Mm. And do the symptoms differ when hydrogen sulfide is found in the small intestine versus large intestine, have you found? Well, you know, one of the big problems that we have is that we really have no um, way to assess the location or the the small intestinal hydrogen sulfide yet we've been promised the uh, famous hydrogen sulfide uh, breath test machines which i've seen in person i have seen the actual machine so i know it exists it's not a fabled (laughs) story but you know to from research to uh to actually bring it to the consumers is is a diff it's like it takes time so that is the thing but we should be seeing some of the uh, some of the ability to test hydrogen sulfide on a breath test, hopefully in 2020, which will be a game changer. Because what I have suspected is that there aren't just patients that have the classic symptoms. It's probably one of those gases that we find in, in different levels of concentration. And because it is a, a reset, like hydrogen sulfide actually is produced by hydrogen, you'll probably find different levels and have different types of symptoms. It's only when we have diarrhea and severe uh, foul gas that we think that this is classic hydrogen sulfide uh, in the small intestine, whereas a lot of the research um, when uh, with hydrogen sulfide production in the colon has actually demonstrated that it acts more as a as a constipation inducer. So this is the other fascinating aspect is that we have two different 
locations of hydrogen sulfide production and that potentially produce different symptoms. And that's not always the case, is it? I know I've definitely, um, I know at the moment for um, investigating or giving us some clues as if, if hydrogen sulfide is a problem in the small intestine, we're using flatlining of the SIBO test results. Um, mm-hmm. But I've yes. actually, yeah, and I've seen a very, like a clear case, uh, which was very exciting for me, actually, a <laughs> clear case <laughs> of uh, flatline. And the person did have that kind of rotten egg smell gas, but was chronically cons- but chronically constipated and had mm-hmm. been for like a number of years. Mm-hmm. And I know that you've seen that too, that it's not always diarrhea yeah. when it comes to and SIBO. You know was- yeah, and I totally agree with that. And this is what I mean. I think we'll find that, the, you know, the gas dynamics – are not cut and dry. They're not black and white. There, there can be methanogens. There can be sulfur-reducing bacteria. Well, actually, let me paraphrase that because one of the things we don't know, and Dr. Pimento, who is one of the you know eminent uh, SIBO researchers in this field, ha- keeps his cards close to his chest because it's not been published a published study yet, and they have isolated. Um, the culprits in terms of who's producing hydrogen sulfide. What we know is in the colon, the primary suspects are sulfur. It's very confusing because it's sulfur reducing bacteria, but it's, it refers to the chemical or biochemical reduction pathway. So it actually is um, hydrogen sulfide production um, by desulfovibrio uh, species and also Bilophila what's worthy of. So those are the two bacteria that we know for sure produce it. What we also know is that there are two different pathways um, that are utilized by different bacteria. So we have the primary pathway that's used by these two bacteria I just mentioned is called the dissimilatory sulfate reduction pathway. That's the main um, pathway for them. Then we also have the desulfhydration pathway that's utilized by organisms like um, streptococcus and helicobacter pylori and and so forth. And then we have a third pathway, which is actually the minor pathway in the colon called the assimilatory sulfide reduction pathway that you, that is classically used by bacteria that we would consider SIBO bacteria mm. like Klebsiella, Enterobacter, Salmonella, you know, those kinds of organisms use this pathway as a minor pathway to produce hydrogen sulfide. So it's very possible that we can have a scenario where um, we don't find desulfovibrio in the small intestine. And perhaps that's one of the reasons why maybe we see also different types of symptoms, possibly. I did have an, a conversation with Dr. Um, Rizai, Dr. Ali Rizai, who also works at Cedar sinai at one of the symposiums. And he said they're already using the machine to uh, measure hydrogen sulfide. And he says they're seeing all sorts of uh, test results come back where hydrogen sulfide is present and it's not flatlining and people have different symptoms. So, you know, I think we, we will we will find that as well as practitioners once we actually have access to these machineries. Oh, I can't wait. Yes, I did listen to that podcast interview you, you did with uh, Dr. Pimentel and he did keep those, those cards close to his <laughs> chest, but it's definitely it's, looks it's, like it's very yeah. near. <laughs> Yeah, and look, that's a different, um, they have a different, uh, 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 well, I should say, that, you know, he's, he's head of what's called MAST or the Medical Associated Technology uh, and, you know, research kind of group where they actually develop this kind of thing for research and they will um, make that available, I think, to their other lab. But um, then we also have uh, possibly Quintron contributing as well. So there are a couple of possibilities where we can see uh, the availability uh, come sooner than later. And a bit of a random question, though. Do you see uh, one of the sulfur-reducing bacteria more so than the other? Like for me personally, I see, especially in the large colon, I see quite a bit of Bilophila wadsworthia or Biophilia wadsworthia, however you want to say it, versus the d vibrio pyga. Well, one of the issues I have is that the only test that I've ever found that tests actually for Bilophila is Eudbiome, right? I don't know if that's the one you're finding. But no, not, Microba th- does as well. <laughs> right. And I don't use Microba. So, you know, I use the other, the Genova. Uh, that's just what I've used for a long time. I find that the, to be the most usable for me. Um, and especially since Ubiome has uh, been shut down by the FBI, yeah. <laughs> sadly. Yes. Uh, but, you know, but so 
I haven't, and, and you know, every practitioner uses different testing yeah. um, and finds different uses out of it. But in my research and in my really looking at different panels, I find personally, I get the most use out of that. But sadly, they don't test for that bug. Yeah. So that would be helpful to have it. But, you know, different labs find different markers to be more useful than others. And it's not really any, they don't follow any rhyme or reason, apparently. Mm -hmm. So they just do what they find uh, it serves them best. And at least it's painting a little bit of a picture, uh, you mm. know, with the hydrogen sulfide case, I should say, for kind of creating that case for if that exists or if that's an issue. Mm -hmm. So yeah. can we kind of expand on the link between hydrogen sulfide and SIBO and hydrogen sulfide and IBSC and LIBO? Yeah. So, so basically, like I said, when you do a stool test, <clears throat> you can you can detect the the presence of these classically um, uh, sulfur reducing bacteria that we mentioned. So that would be the sulfur vibrio species and um, bilophila. So if you have a test that tests for them, but that would only give you give you information about the colon, right? So if you have a patient that has IBSC, then and and very high levels of the of those organisms, then it's very likely that hydrogen sulfide at least contributes because it does affect colonic motility. Mm. Um, like we said, we don't know yet how, other than what we've been told, that it's uh, typically very bad diarrhea and um, these kinds of malodorous uh, gaseous emissions, whether that's uh, burps or gas. And so, you know, we this is all we have. I think we're going to find that when we when we test for it and when we have the ability to test for it, we're going to find all sorts of symptoms um, be explained that we can't we can't really attribute that to hydrogen sulfide yet because we don't know how to test for it yet, you know. So that will be really, really interesting. So we're all waiting for that. And treatment strategies wise, like what do you commonly use to help reduce hydrogen sulfide, SIBO mm. and LIBO? Right. So, um, you know, we it, one of the things with hydrogen sulfide production, at least from the desulfovibrio species, is the problem with antibiotics. They are classically very resistant to antibiotic use. So, and, you know, Dr. Pimentel doesn't even tell us if rifaximin will work. So, so far I have recommended rifaximin for those where we suspect that this is hydrogen sulfide and have had some good success with that. Berberine is a bit of a fence rider. I have not, like, you know, it, it's kind of sometimes you get good results with it and sometimes not. Um, but what we usually use is bismuth and oregano oil. And I do see at least colonic uh, symptoms improve. So constipation and things like that. Now, bear in mind that as naturopathic doctors, we don't ever I, I don't ever just do one thing. I do other things to also retrain the colon. Right. So I will use bismuth. I will use zinc acetate. That's been shown in research to be successful as well as a binder. I, I think that it's any zinc that's poorly absorbed. So it might not, it might be other types of zinc that aren't um, absorbed as well as, let's say, zinc picolinate or citrate. So other types of zinc might be helpful. Um, oregano oil and bismuth are really our three heavy hitters when it comes to hydrogen sulfide. Then there's also a possibility of um, soy isoflavones that have been shown to um, basically stop methanogen uh, and um, well, methanogenesis and hydrogen sulfide uh, production as well if people are equal producers. So it gets a little complicated because you don't know if a person can produce equal from soy isoflavones, which is done by different bacterial species. But um, this is where Ubiome was really helpful because it told you whether or not you had those equal producers. So now it gets a little tricky because not all labs will tell you that. But so that's a, that's another option is to just trial um, hydro uh, or soy isoflavones like genistein or dantzine, uh, you know, as as a potential. But because it is, you know, unlike methanogens and hydrogen production, which is not done by humans, but because it is a human product uh, produced uh, gazotransmitter, I think we'll find that maybe we'll just have to 
control it rather than total eradication. You know what I mean? So yeah. it'll be that'll be really interesting to see as we as we move forward. And then also prebiotics like galacto oligosaccharides have been found also to reduce hydrogen sulfide production. Mm, and I've seen some studies on inulin as well. Have you come across yeah. that? Mm. Yeah, I'm always like, that's the one I will be very hesitant. That one and fructo oligosaccharides when it comes to SIBO. Yes. I don't usually use them. Yeah. 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 I, I, GOS is definitely the first preference, but wanted to see where your head was at with, with inulin. Yeah, <laughs> I saw actually an interesting study. Um, now, the, granted, it was um, presented by like a, as an in-house, I think it was an in-house study by one of the pre products um, that uses inulin and polyphenols. And what they found is that um, it actually shunts hydrogen more into the acetogens rather than hydrogen or methane. So, you know, I, I think there's a place for it. I just haven't found a good formula. And because people are typically quite reactive with SIBO, as you know, mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I wait until SIBO is clear. And, and then I sometimes do use it. And it's much easier to tolerate. And couple of questions around some of those treatment strategies. Bismuth, have you found any ones that are easily accessible in Australia? No. It's <laughs> uh, a short answer. <laughs> um, but you can get it compounded. But, you you know, if you can refer your patient to an open-minded GP, you can get that compounded. And I, I do do that. So can you get into the equal producers a little bit more? Mm. So equal producers, is, so what it's kind of like soy is, we know the beneficial effects of soy when it comes to um, breast cancer prevention, uh, menopausal symptoms, and really being this sort of adaptogenic almost uh, quality to soy. And uh, I'm not, a, I'm not a, at all, uh, an enemy of soy I will tell you that and when I first came to Me Australia I was, I was like what why soy is our friend it's just a bean don't be afraid of it so there's this I think there's a lot of misinformation about soy and of course I am talking about non-gmo organically grown hopefully non-amazon cutting down type of soy right uh, not the stuff that you feed to cattle so basically these isoflavones, dadzine and genistein, are acted upon by gut bacteria. Now, that is not new. We know that actually also um, many polyphenols and also quercetin is actually gained something like is a thousand times more active when acted upon by gut bacteria. So there is a certain amount of bioactivation that happens with gut bacteria and certain polyphenols and bioactives like that. So so that's not a surprise that bacteria act upon uh, these isoflavones from soy and produce something called equal. And equal is actually the thing that makes soy really healthy and anti-estrogenic or at least, um, you know, manages estrogen levels. Uh, uh, well, it's not a good way of saying adaptogenic kind of quality of soy. So the the. The main, uh, I think, phyla or uh, group of bacteria is Egertella. So, you know, Genova doesn't test for Egertella. Uh, I don't know if Microba does. I don't but, think so. And then, and then also another one is called Adler Kreutzia. And Adler Kreutzia was undoubtedly discovered by a man named Adler Kreutz. And uh, he, you know, found that this was a very strong equal producer. And that was, those two were always tested by Ubiome. And it's you can definitely um, see that that level go up when you increase soy isoflavones. And the higher that level, I guess, is, the more you can have the beneficial effects of soy. And in somebody who's not an equal producer, they are unlikely to get a whole lot of benefit um, from genistein or these iso isoflavones. And so what, what they found is when people were producing equal from these isoflavones, that had a down regulatory effect on methane and hydrogen sulfide production. Awesome. And so do you, have you found your use of the soy isoflavones decrease because of the fact that you're not able to see these um, species? No, I just try. Yeah, <laughs> you know, yep. we just often, because it's not, it's not cyanide, it's basically just soy then I usually go with tofu and tempeh. 
which have also found, you know, so I, I use that because they're low FODMAP foods um, and because we needed something for our vegan and vegetarians um, to eat. So I, I often recommend that for people that have also estrogenic symptoms. I sometimes tell people to just try to use um, the SIBO uh, vegetarian biphasic diet. Speaking of the diet, I think that's really important to address because it's different to, say, the low FODMAP when it comes to hydrogen sulfide, isn't it? Well, yeah, and this is where we don't really know enough in terms of SIBO versus LIBO hydrogen sulfide, you know. So it's – but generally what we know with hydrogen sulfide production from these um, sulfur-reducing bacteria that use this dissimilatory pathway – is um, that they they don't necessarily respond at all to a low FODMAP diet. They, you know, they're not reduced by that or they're not affected by that. So, and in fact, they they really thrive on uh, high fat and animal pro- uh, protein and dairy protein and things like that. So, you know, I actually did a Facebook Live this morning and somebody asked me about the carnivore diet and I just about flipped oh, my God. lid. <laughs> Oh, Don't get me started. <laughs> Even get me started. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, I just want to know how they move their bowels. Like how on earth by just eating the carnivore diet would one effectively move their bowels? I just I can't see it. There are lots of different mechanisms um, of peristalsis, but many people that have gut issues, um, you know, they like it's it's it baffles the mind yeah. of what people are willing to try. Um, and for me, there, there is just no place ever for a, for a carnivore diet, for a main, like your carnivore diet. No, I agree. I mean, think about the, uh, the diversity levels just decreasing so rapidly because you're getting no diversity in your diet. You're getting nothing. Um, think about all the functions that we're losing from all those amazing bacterial species that kind of live in there already. Yeah. Just, it frightens me when people go on there. If you think about it, and this this is my concern, is that if there aren't any carbohydrate sources, also for candida, you yeah. know, um, it will it will it will eat the um, the glycocalyx and it will start eating the mucosal yes. layer. You know? Absolutely. So. And look, I understand. I think it was Jordan Peterson and his daughter that brought it to like the famous light because I think that for her autoimmune condition, it really served her. Um, but I think that there was a bit of a danger in people just jumping on the trend like many have done with, say, the keto diet um, and mm-hmm. not, not using it therapeutically. But I still personally would never use a carnivore diet therapeutically, maybe keto, but <laughs> it's mm-hmm. certainly not. With, anyways, it freaks yeah. me out. Um, yeah, I mean, you might as well just do some therapeutic fasting and yes. those kinds of gut rests that have been definitely shown to have great benefit for gut rehabilit- rehabilitation, you know. So, um, yeah. yeah, no, I, I think that, that that's actually quite a detrimental recommendation in my experience or my opinion anyways. Absolutely. Hi, everyone. Just a quick segue to talk about constipation. Did you know that in 2015, a survey of 3,260 Australians found that over a third of the population experienced constipation symptoms? Constipation not only leaves us feeling sluggish, toxic, bloated, and at times antisocial, it can also increase our risk of all-cause mortality by 12%, heart disease by 11%, and ischemic stroke by 19%. So if you struggle with digestive health that leaves you feeling antisocial, frustrated, and flat, maybe you've even self-prescribed to the nines with little or no results, please do get in contact. As an experienced natural healthcare practitioner, constipation is my specialty. Over many years, I have seen many patients respond well to treatment, and the good news is that sometimes the management is very straightforward. An added bonus is that my consultations are run online, which means it does not matter where you are located, I can work with you. So to schedule in a naturopathic nutrition consultation with me, simply head to my website, lindagriprich.com, and go to the book and appointment page there. Or send an email to info at lindagriprich.com. Now back to the podcast. 
And are there any sort of supplement? So dietary wise, we definitely, you know, you want to be reducing a sat- uh, the saturated fat and animal protein, possibly dairy. Um, how strict do you get with the low sof- low sulfur vegetables? Because this is something that I kind of go, look, it depends on how the severe the symptoms are, but let's just have like a, a minimum to moderate amount of that and just increase those other foods that are less sulfur rich. Exactly. That's what I do too. And it really depends on the severity and the presentation, right? So if somebody doesn't have a lot of these sulfur sensitivity symptoms that we mentioned, the burning, the joint pain, the rashes, even headaches, that kind of thing, I may not go all full out with, with sulfur reduction. I might just do the main heavy hitters, you know, um, like garlic and onions, which are anyways avoided. But also kale tends to be a problem and, and some brassicas. But, but, you know, it's interesting because some research shows no, no difference at all by reducing uh, brassica families. So uh, which is, of course, your broccoli and, and things like that. So I tend to just tell people to do the low sulfur diet. It's a handout that people can download for free from the SIBOdoctor.com. And uh, it, it basically it groups it into uh, high uh, and low and, and so forth. And you can just kind of play around with it. But when some people that are very, very symptomatic, I say do it for a month and then start to put uh, like like lower sul- like vegetable sulfur back in, but maybe leave eggs out for a little while longer, you know, mm. that kind of thing. Yeah. And so those, and just if, if people aren't aware of where the sulfur is found in the vegetables, we're talking about those sort of cruciferous vegetables like broccoli, cabbage, kale, cauliflower, you know, collards, Brussels sprouts, all those sorts of things. So they are fantastic foods. Um, but yeah, it really depends on where the person is at with their symptoms. And I think mm. for me, the important thing would be as well just to hone in on like how much saturated fat are they eating? You know, are they eating heaps of exactly. coconut oil, coconut creams, butters, ghees, all that sort of stuff? Because outside of um, really um, increasing these whole tr- hydrogen sulfide producers, it helps, it doesn't help, but it helps to, in- well, it does increase the absorption of LPS, which we don't want. We right. want to be reducing that systemic inflammation. So mm-hmm. Exactly. Yes. So what about those particular um, supplements that we might want to avoid when it comes to those that are experiencing problems with hydrogen sulfide? Um, Do you mean like the thiol containing ones like the, you know, NAC or the um, glutathione types of things, you know, I'm thinking more the collagogs and those. those oh, so, yes, yeah, yeah. collagogs for sure. So collagogs are herbs that move bile or increase bile flow, um, and or and actually increase bile production. Choleretics are actually herbs that move bile, but all of those are groups of of herbs that are wonderful and amazing, uh, but you know can be a problem with uh, with people that have these types of organisms in their large bowel. We don't know yet, like I said, if um, that also applies to small intestinal bacterial overgrowth where hydrogen sulfide is the main uh, gaze or transmitter or the gas that's produced. Um, But then also I would avoid things like ox bile, uh, all kinds of uh, substances that uh, really feed these desulfo vibrio in bilophila. And uh, the probiotics as well. I know that you've mentioned L. plantarum LPS8. Is that not still not available in Australia? You know, I just use regular L. plantarum. Okay, two nine nine V. Two nine nine V is a well uh, well studied strain, and I just use that. Yeah. You know, so I don't know. I think it's the combination of everything we're doing, but it's it is a research strain. Um, and yeah, I haven't, I haven't found that, you know, it's surprising to me that, that there aren't more companies getting on the hydrogen sulfide bandwagon, um, or these, these labs, it's, there's always seems to be a bit of a lag that the practitioners have to really kind of work with it first. And then there is sort of, um, all of a sudden there'll be some products for hydrogen sulfide come out. I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah. And, and do you see much of hydrogen sulfide SIBO cases? Not that many. Yeah, me too. I see mostly, and it is, that's what they say. It's really not the primary type of SIBO, 
Um, but again, when do we talking- do we know? Because we don't really know if we're assessing it like to the letter, right. you know. <laughs> well, right. Well, if but you know, my conversation with Dr. Razai, who is who works for this lab that or that uses hydrogen sulfide um, or looks at hydrogen sulfide for research purposes at this point, he said that they found hydrogen sulfide all the time on these breath tests, you know. And the the problem has always been that it's extremely. Uh, you know, first of all, we don't really know the normal reference ranges because it's also endogenously produced. So this has been the difficulty. And so even now that we have access to or will have access to this, are we just the first wave that actually creates normal reference ranges for these labs? Do you know? Those are the questions I have because they just have started this in a way. You know, I mean, of course they have their, 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 people that they're researching, but I'm always wondering, do we have to still be very vigilant or um, be very questioning as practitioners always and not buy everything hook, line and sinker, I find. Yeah, yeah. And has your treatment of hydrogen sulfide changed like dramatically over the years? Because you've done a lot of research in this area. You know, I've learned a lot from you in regards to hydrogen sulfide. So I'd love to hear how it's changed for you. Well, you know, I had this wonderful experience of um, giving my presentation that you may have done the the hydrogen sulfide masterclass on the Cebo doctor. And I presented that in, um, I think it was in New Orleans or in Chicago or uh, at the Cebo Symposium. Oh, Cibo, the CIBOCON, the Integrative uh, Cibo Conference, and Allison was in the in the audience, and I had not heard ever her speak about hydrogen sulfide. For some reason, I hadn't come across any of her material, and it was so interesting because we came up with totally different plans, except for bismuth. Bismuth was um, something we both came across, of course, but she hadn't heard of the isoflavones. I hadn't heard of oregano oil. Uh, so we kind of, you know, I mean, she's a dear friend and colleague. So it was a, one of those wonderful moments of like, oh my God, we can, you know, we, we kind of came up with totally different stuff. How exciting. So, um, so that, you know, so now that we, we combined it, it really, we know bismuth, we know oregano, we know zygacetate and isoflavone. So, and L, or I, um, Lactobacillus plantarum, and um, and it was Jason who added the gauze to this. Jason Horlack, who added the uh, prebiotic. That's where um, I got that from him. You of know? course, he so, did. Yeah, it's <laughs> Mister Mister Prebiotic. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, it wouldn't be Jason if he wasn't adding in a prebiotic, but that's cool because I love to use them myself. But it's yeah. funny you should say that about hydrogen sulfide and Alison. I actually had her on a long time ago talking about hydrogen sulfide. So I must go and re-listen to that and see if there's what are the differences here. Mm. Um, mm. So is there anything else that you'd like to say on this topic to our audience? Um, yeah, let's see, what, what should I say about hydrogen sulfide that we haven't yet talked about? Um, it, it, I think we have to also keep in mind that there is a body of research that looks at the beneficial effects of hydrogen sulfide, right? So, um, there are actually finding that very low amounts of hydrogen sulfide can really induce this anti-inflammatory effect. Um, and they, they're looking into combining it with NSAIDs or non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, which are well-known inducers of intestinal permeability and mucosal damage. So that's really fascinating to me. And, and it kind of gels with me to think that we don't have to immediately vilify uh, organisms that are just doing their thing, right? Yes. Um, and try to go in there and get rid of them and all of that um, you know, like somebody was actually asking me this morning in this um, on on Facebook about uh, how to get. I think it was about hydrogen sulfide. I can't even remember now. It seems like years ago, but it's just this morning. <laughs> <laughs> you know how that goes. Um, but basically, in the way I said it was the way I think about many of these organisms, whether those are their hydrogen producers, or like specifically in the colon. Yeah, oh, that's right. The question was, what about how do you treat LIBO or large intestine bacterial overgrowth compared to SIBO? Is it, is the treatment different? And the way I think about large intestinal overgrowth also with hydrogen sulfide is more 
that, you know, they're meant to be there. They're even Klebsiella, Pseudomonas. Yes, we don't want them in high amounts, but to go in there and just kill, kill, kill is not the right way. And the way I think about it is when you have a test that shows very high levels of gram negatives, it's kind of like you have um, a block party with a bunch of teenagers and there are, is just no supervision, right? Mm. You wouldn't go in there and kill the teenagers. You just put <laughs> Right. So so just so thinking and having more respect for this organ that is our microbiome has really been my focus this year is to get that message out. And I'm also speaking at Woodford about microbiome restoration. And I'm really taking that on board in terms of that we are as practitioners, our patients, microbiome custodians. And rather than going in there and constantly killing, we really have to understand that this precious organ uh, needs love, needs attention, and needs also just balance, right? So, for example, even with blastocystis. Now oh, I, know I was going to say breast- that. <laughs> yes, blastocystis is What a good a example p- of it, though. Yeah, exactly. Now, bear in mind the subtype is important. Mm-hmm. Um, so, blastocystis hominis is a parasite, or it's been classified as parasite. It's a protozoan. That's very, very commonly found. And in my new course, the Advanced Depot Case Management, I have a section on blastocystis and defragilis, dientamoeba fragilis. And these are organisms that in research are really not associated with pathology, right? And actually are found in healthy microbiomes. Yes. So this is an example of how, you know, as practitioners, I know this feeling of you've done the, the stool test, you find something and you just want to go in there and kill it. But to actually really understand that this has been, of course, I will preface this by saying there are, of course, instances where I do want to go in there and kill something. It's not always that I want to just put in the supervisors, but I do that less and less these days. So um, I think that's a good place to end that conversation on LIBO maybe. Definitely. And I think Blast has a really good example of what you're saying here, because we're not just treating the report, we're marrying it up with the symptoms and and everything else that's going on, the case history that we've taken. And so, you know, I I, I agree with you just going in there and, and killing based on what we've found in a report is just not the way to go. And, you know, mm-hmm. Blasto, Blasto is a great example. It is found in healthy individuals too, in healthy microbiomes. And so, when we see mm-hmm. that, it doesn't mean that we – and we see that everywhere up here in northern New South Wales. <laughs> yeah, but sure do. I have blastocystis. I'm a I, I did too. <laughs> yes. And, you know, my my diversity score was 100%. I'm fine. You know, like it's all good. And, and it's just a normal little kind of maybe a curmudgeon little neighbor somewhere in that neighborhood if we think of it that way. Or maybe it, it serves a purpose, you know. That's so. what I feel as well. I've, I've got blasto as well. I, well. I had it a couple of years ago. wasn't too concerned because I wasn't presenting with any symptoms at all. Um, just had a chuckle that it was there and I was like, well, I live in the northern New South Wales now. That's just That just goes part and yeah. parcel with what happens. That's but, right. Uh, <laughs> um, excellent. So I have one more question for you that I do like to ask all of my guests and that is what's the first book or movie that comes to mind that has had much impact in your life and why and it doesn't necessarily need to be reference or anything like that just anything really that comes to mind oh my god i'm completely drawing a blank (laughs) movie or movie or book that had an impact you're saying yeah that you remember and that it really has touched you in some way oh there's so many but the first thing that comes to mind is maybe because I've had a recent conversation about it is the movie Avatar. Oh. I just love the movie Avatar and it's so relevant to what we're experiencing on planet Earth right now in terms of species extinction. And I think this is a nice tie in to um, species, species extinction also in the microbiome, right? Mm. So as within, so without. So we really do see this correlation of um, decimation of microbiome as well as this the sixth great uh, extinction that we're experiencing on this planet at this time. So for me that was really um, a, a monumental movie and uh, loved it in every aspect. But of course there there are many others that I could say have had touched me very deeply. Um, but I think this is a nice a nice tie into our conversation. It's perfect. It's fantastic. <laughs> I love Avatar. 
So yeah. I'd love for you to share with our audience what we can find on the SIBOdoctor.com platform courses wise. I think like I keep saying it is such a valuable tool tool. Of course, I'm going to pop that up on the um, in the show notes, but there is a section on what we've spoken about. So hydrogen sulfide, mm. SIBO and LIBO. Uh, what else can practitioners find on there? Well, I have been a busy little bee this this year, uh, and basically, I wanted to have a streamlined pathway to SIBO mastery. and And really, what I've created is um, a way for practitioners to become very, very proficient uh, in not just the treatment of SIBO, but pretty much IBS. And so, it's a three step program called the SIBO Mastery. And the first step is the fundamentals of SIBO, which is a three module or um, three-section kind of course. And then we have the, the SIBO um, hydrogen sulfide and methane masterclasses. And this new course that I'm really loving to write because it's the advanced SIBO case management course. And when you've done all three as a practitioner, you can be listed in the SIBO, uh, find a SIBO practitioner database that we are now reviewing and uh, really updating for for the masses of patients that are contacting us on a daily basis looking for practitioners. So we really wanted to take it on that we have very qualified practitioners listed in this database. So that's that's what I've been busy with, and I'm just completing this eight-module course that's the Advanced SIBO Case Management, and it really covers everything from symptom management to uh, deep diving into leaky gut to this fascinating topic of the enteric nervous system, the limbic system injury, uh, you know, like I teach people how to do colonics or enemas for, and hydrotherapy and like all, I mean, I just gave it my all this course and um, how to treat LIBO and all, all, all sorts of things. And what am I writing with it? Number six, I'm just finishing up. Oh yeah, that's the um, SIBO matrix, which is uh, lesson six of this course, which is all about genomic, uh, genomic contributions and, uh, systemic issues that that con- uh, contribute as to why people aren't improving and uh, next lesson lesson seven is all about uh, the syndromes that are associated with SIBO so we have MCAS or mastal activation syndrome and uh, stealth infections and mold toxicity and you know I really left no stone unturned and really gave you everything that I encounter every day uh, in my practice with these really advanced cases. So that is the SIBO Mastery Program. For, so that's been my offerings this year, and that can be found on the SIBOdoctor.com. Beautiful. And I'll definitely be looking forward to uh, doing the advanced SIBO case management course for sure. And again, I highly recommend health practitioners go and check it out. Like you said, you definitely don't leave any stone unturned. Like there's lots of (laughs) downloads and valuable videos for us to really sharpen our saw in practice. And it certainly has refined the way that I uh, treat the gut health, you know, these conditions, SIBO and LIBO and IBS mm. and various things. So thank you so much, Norella. It's been a pleasure. It's been an absolute pleasure having you on. And, uh, guys, if you've enjoyed this conversation, I would love it if you could share it with everyone that you know would benefit. And while you're at it, please leave a ratings and review on iTunes so that others can find Love and Guts easily and can fill up on this valuable content from Dr. Norella Jacoby as well. Thank you for making it to the very end of this podcast episode. One more thing before you go. If you struggle with digestive health that leaves you feeling antisocial, frustrated and flat, you've self-prescribed to the nines with little or no results, please do get in contact. I've seen many people improve the quality of their life simply by seeking the support of a qualified health practitioner such as myself. The good news is my consultations are run online, which means it does not matter where you are located, I can work with you. To schedule in a naturopathic and nutrition consultation with me, simply head to my website, lindagriprich.com, and go to the book a consultation page. Or send an email to info at lindagriprich.com.